So I do feel just a little bit like the Grinch, you know, being like, maybe we should just skip the third Sunday of joy and go straight to the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is love, since we're going to miss it anyway next week, since it's also Christmas Eve. But I'm not really alone in that. Um, I think of all of my good Jewish friends and colleagues involved in the peace movement and how many times I've heard in the last week and a half, I don't really feel like saying Happy Hanukkah, you know, with the horrific imaginings of what the families of hostages are going through and then with the absolute devastation of civilian life in Gaza. And then in Bethlehem, I don't know if you all saw it in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, but they did actually decide to cancel Christmas. They decided to cancel every public display of Christmas, the very small Palestinian Christian um, remnant that is still there across denominations said there'll be no twinkling lights, there'll be no Christmas tree on Manger Square, not until the people of Gaza have some relief. And then in our own congregation, you know, I admit, we've got a lot of folks struggling with loss. We've got some folks who are really, really in a rough spot. And so in that place, the Apostle Paul's word, rejoice always. You know, it feels a little bit like a little girl on the airplane, color, daddy, color, you know. But you can't accuse the Apostle Paul of being immune to suffering. This is the same Paul who was, you know, shipwrecked and beaten and lashed and danger from robbers, danger from thieves, danger on land, danger in sea. I mean, this is the same one who wrote the beautiful words in Philippians, rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, who wrote those words from prison, right? So he knew a great deal about suffering, even as he wrote, wrote these beautiful words that command us to, to live as joyful people. No doubt, Paul who started off as Saul the Israelite, who was very, very gifted in the Torah, would have known that in the Hebrew scripture, in the sacred story, joy can be a commandment. It can be a mitzvah. It can be something that you are required to do. Like Deuteronomy 16, right? The Feast of Sukkot that just led right up to Simchat Torah, right up to October 7th, where, you know, for seven days you shall have a festival and you shall be joyful you and your family and your servants and the Levite and the stranger and the widow and the orphan, and there will be no end to your joy. Really? You shall be joyful and there will be no end to your joy. But when you step back and you look at the scripture, it's really helpful to see that it's not so much joy as this a state of being, I just feel so joyful, as joy is about a set of behaviors. And the set of behaviors that are outlined here is have a party, celebrate, get people together, especially who? Those who are on the margins, the widow and the vulnerable. You're supposed to have this party and it's supposed to include everyone. Why? Because our joy would be so much richer right now if every child on the planet had a full belly and a school to go to and a safe place to lay down, right? So there is this invitation to both Invite, share, the people closest to you, of course, your children, your servants, your workers, but everyone. And in this, too, you hear an echo of the scripture today, this beautiful passage where, this is my favorite passage just about where these two women who are very much on the margins, who are very vulnerable, come together. So Elizabeth, you know, the older aunt, the kinswoman, little Mary, vulnerable, pregnant, unwed, she goes to see her kinswoman, who is also old to be believed to be barren, vulnerable as well. These women on the margin, and the scripture tells us that when Mary, who made haste to go see her kinswoman Elizabeth, when she greets her, the babe in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist, she's six months further along, what does it do? It leaps for joy. And I just love that, because that is what happens when we greet one another, right? I mean, the life inside of us quickens. You even see those studies that show like, you know, because my kids are always annoyed by the fact that I greet everybody you pass, but they actually say it's really, really good for people's mental health. Like talking to people on the subway, just making small talk in the grocery store, like the more you have those little interactions, what happens? The life inside you quickens, right? I mean, there's like a little bit of you when you, and then the people, the deeper, more complex relationships we have when we can share who we are. I mean, that, that's what we do every single Sunday here. We come in here to this place and when we see one another, when we see one another, when I look at you, 
people I love and care for and people I'm coming to love and care for. What happens? I mean, the life inside me quickens. And then what happens? These two women went straight for resistance. Then Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God's my, God my Savior. God has looked with favor upon this lowly servant and God has done what? Lifted up the poor and scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And God has fed the poor with good things and sent the rich away empty. Jesus, the socialist, his family, right? That's what it's all about. It's like connection leads to joy, which leads to resistance, which leads to a new world order. I keep thinking about kites. I keep thinking about this beautiful kibbutz just south of Gaza, kibbutz Kafar Azah. This kibbutz where a bunch of, let's be honest, left-leaning Israeli peace activists lived, and once a year, they would have this kites for freedom. And even though Hamas was sending rockets their way, they'd make these beautiful kites and they'd sail them across the Gaza border. Kites with messages, maybe kites some year, Shimon Perez, some peace person still, some word, we send you love, we send you peace, we send you hope. And then of course, I can't help but see those beautiful pictures of children. You know, in the Middle East, you know, whether it's Afghanistan or whatever, kids fly a lot more, kites don't have as much stuff, right? These beautiful pictures of those children gathered on the Gaza beach at that United Nations summer camp. Some of you know this, that after Hamas was elected in 2006, the last time there were elections in Gaza, let's not forget, it's not like all the people there are like waving the Hamas flag before this happened, right? United Nations, the year of the blockade, 2006, started these summer camps. 130,000 Palestinian children, little Gaza kids, for six weeks come together, now it's like several hundred thousand, having this tiny moment in the midst of this blockade where these children who have been so victimized can celebrate. Maybe you saw the picture in 2009 where they set the world record for flying the most kites. The, the sky was lit up with 3,000 kites. And then the next summer in 2010, China had some giant technical kite flying association place and they came back and smashed that record with 10,000 kites. And then in 2011, the little kids from Gaza showed right back up on that beach, 12,150 kites. That was a good year for the summer camp at the United Nations with sponsored by UNRWA because that year, the little children of Gaza smashed four world records. Before they did the kites, they had already set the world record for the bouncing or dribbling the most soccer balls of several thousand kids for five minutes. And then they set the record for launching the most parachutes into the sky. And then they set a record, a beautiful record, which involves so many kids with disabilities. They made this 5,000 meter square giant hand painting where all these children, just this beautiful tapestry of little children's hands on this giant, giant tarp. And to listen to the little children talk about it, we're the best, we're the best, and when I fly my kite, I believe I'm a child like anyone else and I have rights. I made my, child, my kite like the Palestinian flag and it makes me feel like me and my country are soaring up into the sky. Joy, that's resistance, right? That's saying, we will not be defined by your violence and your rage and your anger and your hate and your division. I don't need to stand here today and tell you what happened to that kibbutz what happened to the couple, their three teenagers who had led it for 15 years. The Kites for Freedom Day that year, this year, was October 7th. I don't need to tell you what happened, and I don't need to tell you that that summer camp on the Gaza beach probably won't happen this summer with so much of what we know destroyed. What I need to tell you as one of your pastors is this. We have got to figure out a way to make our lives be like a kite flying in the sky. Rafat al who was a professor at University of Gaza, philosopher, English professor, poet, he was really a very beloved person, courageous as well as controversial in Israel, but he wrote a beautiful poem about November 1st. He had said already that the biggest weapon I have is the marks a lot. And if they come for me, I'll throw that at the soldiers. He wrote this poem, which invited us to imagine his life like a kite. And it began, if I die, you must live. You must live to tell my story, to let it sail into the air. 
Rafat was killed on December 6th. It was pretty clearly a targeted assassination. He was the only, only unit in his building there in Gaza. He died with his brother and his sister and her three children, adding to the 30 people in their family who'd already died. And after he died, his poem in the Israeli and the Palestinian peace community and all over the world began to be shared. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment, an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. We're alive on this third Sunday of Advent, on this Sunday of joy. Our lives have to be that kite. We have to wake up in the morning and connect deeply. Go for a run, go for a walk. If you can't do that, sit in the window and look out at this gorgeous world. And then reach out. Reach out to someone you hadn't planned to reach out to. Write a card, write an email, bake some cookies, and when they come out of the oven, eat them and then wrap them up and take them out on the street and send the White House a message today and say, we want a different world. We want to fund a different world, right? We must live. Our lives must be a kite flying into the sky with a different message. And the message is always this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Don't get in the way of the spirit of life and beauty. Replace evil with love. Be a sign of joy in this world. Resistant, powerful, hope-filled joy. Amen. Amen.